is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and this chapter is going to be largely about speaking in tongues. This may be a confusing or controversial issue for us. We may have heard a variety of things about speaking in tongues. We may have heard that it's of the devil or that it was only for the early church, yet we hear about people that have had this experience and they say, you've come too late to tell us it's not of God, we know it's of God. And so sometimes we really don't know what to believe about speaking in tongues. And Paul lays down some instructions and an order about speaking in tongues and that there is a time and a place for it and that there is not a time and a place for it. So this chapter may answer a lot of the questions that we have about speaking in tongues. Verse 1, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So Paul says, follow after charity. That's a good thing. Have the motive of love. In chapter 13, he addressed the importance of having the motive of love. That's what's going to keep everything pure, is to have the right motive. And it's good to desire spiritual gifts. He talked about spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. God has many gifts of the Spirit, the gift of faith, healing, counsel, discernment, miracles. But he said, rather that ye may prophesy. Paul puts the emphasis on prophesying or speaking God's words with understanding. That's the important thing for us to covet or to go after because speaking God's words is what's going to give a multitude of people life. Verse 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. So here Paul contrasts prophesying with speaking in an unknown tongue. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1, Paul talks about the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. Now the tongues of men is what took place on the day of Pentecost. We'll note that when these men and women were preaching and teaching God's words on the day of Pentecost, they were preaching to a mixed group of Jews who did not all speak the same language. So the gift of tongues was necessary. This was a gift, meaning that they spoke in another language, even though they did not know that language, God's Spirit moved through them to speak in a language that people from these other countries could understand. So there was definitely a need for that gift of tongues for God's words to be given out to all those people so that they could understand them. But Paul also talks about the tongues of angels in 1 Corinthians 13. And the tongues of angels is also like what Paul talked about in Romans chapter 8. When we're praying to God and we don't know what it is that we need, the Spirit can make intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So the tongues of angels, it's a language that no one else can understand. Now, God is not a God of a particular language. He is a God of ideas. God can understand what we're praying for, no matter what language or nationality we are. He is a God of ideas. So when we speak in this tongue of angels, we're praying to God, we're asking Him for what we need, and He knows what we're saying. However, if we're in a church service and we're speaking in this unknown tongue, we're not speaking unto men, but we're speaking unto God. If we're speaking in a language that no one else in the church service can understand, we're not edifying them, we're not doing anything for anyone else in the congregation because no one knows what we're saying. To them it sounds like a bunch of gibberish. It's a mystery. Verse 3, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So here's the contrast again. Paul's going to go back and forth and make this contrast between speaking in an unknown tongue and prophesying or speaking God's words with inspiration, with understanding. So if we're in a church service and we're preaching God's word with understanding, it's going to edify a many-membered body of people. Not only will it edify us in our mind, but it will build other people up spiritually. They will receive some ideas of God. They'll get an understanding of the scriptures. It will exhort them. It can comfort them. God's understanding is a comfort to know what he believes, to know what is truth, to help us counteract falsehoods and fears within our mind. God's word is a comfort. Verse 4, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So we may think that, you know, someone getting up in church and speaking in an unknown tongue, boy, that's, that's really holy. And it is good to speak in tongues, as Paul is going to show in this chapter, but there's a time and a place for it. We may have a church service, and there may be some 
pressing in or praying into the Spirit in the beginning of the church service to see what God's will is for the service. But what Paul is talking about in this chapter is let's not get carried away with it. Let's not let this speaking in tongues go on the whole church service. But when we gather together, it's to exhort one another. It's to preach and teach God's words. So if we're speaking in tongues, we may be edifying ourselves. We may be pulling in some of God's Spirit that we need for our own spiritual body. But if someone is prophesying or speaking God's words with understanding, they're edifying the whole church because people can understand what's being said. Verse 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Now this is really interesting. Here in chapter 14, Paul says, I would that ye all spake with tongues. He's not saying it's a bad thing. It's a good thing. Now we may have heard another scripture that the very same writer said that may have caused us some confusion. If we go back to 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says that tongues shall cease. And maybe that's the only part of that scripture we heard. But let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13 and let's look at the whole scripture and the scripture following that. And if we look at that scripture in context, it really doesn't take one to be very studied or educated in the scriptures to clearly see what the context is when Paul says that tongues will cease. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he says that charity never faileth. But whether there be tongues, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So point one, is knowledge going to vanish away? Is there going to be a time when there's not going to be any knowledge? Well, the answer to that is no. Because it says in the Old Testament that as the waters cover the seas, so shall the knowledge of God fill the earth. God's knowledge is eternal. It's never going to vanish. Is prophecy going to cease? No. So what's the context here? Paul goes on to say in chapter 13, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. The context in chapter 13 is that Paul is saying that tongues in part, prophecy in part, knowledge in part is going to cease that is going to vanish away because the whole point he's talking about in chapter 13 is that we need to have the motive of love like he says in verse 2 that you can have all knowledge but if you don't have charity you're nothing that's the kind of knowledge that's going to cease knowledge that has wrong motives in it that has misunderstanding in it so the lesser depth of speaking in tongues that wrong motives has gotten into, that misunderstandings has gotten into, that hasn't been governed by God's word, that's going to cease when that which is perfect is come. What is Paul doing in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians? He's given them a more perfect way of speaking in tongues. He's given them some instructions, some order to govern this speaking in tongues. That which is perfect had come. And speaking in tongues wasn't just for the early church. There's no scripture that says that. But we can have the same experience at this time. But God does want it to be governed by his ideas, by his order, so that it does stay holy. So Paul would not say in one chapter tongues is going to cease. Then in the next chapter encourage them to speak with tongues. It's the lesser depth of tongues that is going to cease when something deeper comes. So back in verse 5 in chapter 14... He says, I wish you would all speak with tongues. It's a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. It's a great way to have a personal communication with God, to speak in tongues, to yield our mind to his spirit, to pull in what we need for our spiritual body. It is enriching. It is a positive experience. But when you're in a church service, that's the time to be prophesying because greater is he that prophesieth than he that speak with, speaketh with tongues. And that's because when we speak in tongues, we're only edifying ourselves. When we're prophesying, we can edify a many-membered body of people. We're really spreading life around. So if someone is going to speak in tongues, they better hope there's a gift of interpretation there because that's the only way anyone else is going to be edified is if there is a gift of interpretation that can interpret what is being said. Six. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. 
So Paul says, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what is that going to profit you? Well, the answer is nothing unless Paul would speak by revelation, by revealing some of God's truth, by imparting some knowledge to them. In other words, speaking in words that can be understood. Seven, and even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? So Paul uses a natural example. Take a pipe or a harp, a musical instrument. If you just start making a bunch of noises on an instrument, there's no discernible melody or harmony. Nobody's going to know what you're playing. Same thing in the spirit realm. If we're not preaching a clear message in a language that can be understood with understanding, how is anyone going to know what's being talked about? Eight, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So he goes back to the Old Testament and uses an example. Back at that time, under the Moses Law, if they wanted to make a call and call people to meet at the tabernacle, they blew a certain tune on the trumpet. If it was time to go to war, they blew a different message on the trumpet. And if that trumpet player didn't give a clear sound, they could be in big trouble. If he wasn't giving some clear toots on that trumpet and people thought, oh, it's time to meet at the tabernacle and it was really time to go to war, they were in trouble. They weren't prepared. Well, that's the same way in the spirit realm for us. We need to know what God's message is. We need to know what his understanding is so that we can prepare ourselves in the spirit realm. If we don't know what God's message is, how are we going to prepare ourselves to battle? How are we going to know that there's a spirit realm battle to be fought, that there's a spiritual enemy, and that God has spiritual weapons for us to fight with? If someone is speaking in tongues, we're not going to get anything out of it. Nine, so likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Another example would be if you had a disease and you wanted help with this disease, would you go to a doctor that spoke Chinese when you were English and there was no communication between the two of you? No, you would go to someone where you could get an understanding. What's my problem? What can you do to help me? What are the instructions? And so likewise in the spirit realm, we need to utter words that are easy to be understood, otherwise we might as well be talking into the air. Ten, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification. So there are a lot of different languages in the world and none of them is insignificant. They're all significant to the people that speak that particular language. Eleven, therefore if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. But if there's two people that aren't speaking the same language, they're looking at each other and they're talking and they're like barbarians to each other. No one knows what the other one is saying. Twelve, even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. So Paul stresses again, you guys may be zealous of spiritual gifts. He was talking to the Corinthians, you may be determined and on fire to get all these spiritual gifts of God, but he said, seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Go after these voice gifts, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Work God's words in your mind. Speak them out in a clear, discernible way. That is what's going to edify the many-membered body. Thirteen, wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So if you're going to speak in an unknown tongue, pray for interpretation so others can be edified and not just you. Otherwise, you might be talking to yourself and God, but no one else. 14, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So if we get up and speak in the tongues of angels and, and our spirit is praying, we may be pulling in uh, different fruits of the spirit. Our spirit is praying, but our understanding is unfruitful because we're not producing any spiritual fruit in anybody else's mind. By giving understanding, we're just pulling in spirit for us, but no one else is getting anything out of it. Verse 15, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. So Paul, again, is emphasizing understanding. The only way we're going to get life out of God's words is to understand them. So whatever we're doing, if we're preaching and teaching, if we're singing, whatever it is, make sure there is understanding. Verse 16, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit... How shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen, at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. So when you're blessing with the Spirit, when you're 
speaking in tongues in this unknown language, you may be blessing yourself by pulling in some of God's Spirit, but someone that has come to the church service that is unlearned, that wants to know some of God's knowledge, how is he going to say, Amen, I agree, that's just the way it is, that witnesses, that's God's truth. If he hasn't understood a word you're saying, if, it, if to him it's just a bunch of gibberish, he hasn't understood what's been said. 17, for thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. You're, you're doing a great job of giving thanks. You're, you're refreshing your own spirit. You're refreshing God. You're praying in tongues. That's great, but who else is edified? Nobody else is edified. 18, I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than you all. So Paul says, thank God. Speaking in tongues is okay. I do it more than all of you. Yet, in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So if we have the idea that the thing to do to really be holy and deep is to get up in church and speak in tongues for 20 minutes, Paul here is saying, no, it's good to speak in tongues, but in church, in a church service, I would rather speak five words with understanding than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Why? So that I can teach other people. So some life can go forth and edify others. 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Now this is an interesting scripture because oftentimes we've heard, maybe when we ask questions, you don't need to understand the scriptures. You'll understand that after you die. Now don't, don't get too particular. Paul says don't be children in understanding. That means we need to understand these scriptures. Not only do we need to understand them, but we need to grow up in understanding. Like Paul said in chapter 13 again, I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. How are we going to grow up in understanding? It says in Isaiah, whom shall he teach knowledge? Whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Those that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. As we get God's precepts, his ideas within our mind, yes, we start out on the milk, just like a baby starts out on the milk, like it says in the New Testament, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We start out on the milk, but then God wants to be able to teach us some knowledge, some understanding. He wants us to grow up in understanding. It says that wisdom has built her house, but understanding has established it. Understanding is what is going to establish the spiritual house within our mind, getting God's words and knowing what they mean. He says, however, in malice, be children. Well, why should we be a child in malice? Well, malice means evil, sin. Little children, little babies, when they're born into the world, they don't have sin within their mind. It takes us developing the ability to conceive thoughts and take in ideas to start taking in sin into our mind. So little babies are sin free. We should be malice in children. We should get back to that condition in our mind of being sin free, but in understanding we should be men. That word men was translated perfect. God wants us to perfect our understanding. Not just have a little bit, but perfect it. 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. So we should be understanding in men because it was even prophesied in the Old Testament that there would come a time when God would speak to people with a deeper depth of understanding. And this prophecy again is taken from Isaiah 28 where it says that with stammering lips and another tongue he would speak to this people and they would not hear. Well, it's true that this was a prophecy that there would be speaking in tongues like we see in Acts chapter 2 where these believers came out on the day of Pentecost and they spoke in tongues. But more importantly, this is talking about God speaking with a deeper depth of understanding. And to some people, that does sound like a totally new language. That's the way it sounded to the Jews when Christ and the disciples came on the scene at the time of the early church. That's why Paul was persecuting and killing these early church Christians. He thought they were teaching some totally new doctrine. But what Christ did is he came and he brought a deeper understanding of the law. He brought it over into the spirit realm. So this was the other tongue. This was the other lips that God was speaking with. A deeper understanding. And for the most part, people would not hear it. 22. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. 
So speaking in tongues is a sign not to those that believe. If someone's a believer, they've already had the experience of speaking in tongues. But speaking in tongues can be a sign to someone who is an unbeliever, someone who is unlearned in God. They can get this experience of speaking in tongues, and it can be a witness to them. This is some deeper spirit. This is a richer experience with God. And that's a good thing. But prophesying doesn't serve for an unbeliever, someone that is unlearned, they shouldn't be coming to church and getting up and prophesying because they may not have anything to prophesy about. But prophesying is for a believer. So if we're a believer, we, we shouldn't be getting up in church and taking up a church service speaking in tongues. But we've got some understanding in our mind. We should be sharing that. We should be getting up and prophesying. 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, <laughs> will they not say that you are mad? Well, if here you have a whole group of people and they're just all speaking in tongues and it sounds like a bunch of gibberish and crazy people and someone unlearned comes in, you're going to scare them off. They may think you're crazy and leave. It'll just be a bunch of confusion to them. 24, but if all prophesy... And there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned. He is convinced of all. He is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. This is the importance of prophesying. If we're preaching God's words with understanding, and someone comes in that's unlearned, that doesn't have God's knowledge, and they hear this preaching and this teaching, they hear a clear, discernible message, they're convinced of all. They can say, yes, that is truth. They can be convinced of your doctrine. They're judged of all. And the secrets of their heart are made manifest. This could be a variety of things. God's preaching and teaching can reveal a multitude of things to our mind. It can reveal answers to questions that we've had. It can show up misunderstandings in our mind that has confused us. It can show up the sin within our mind that we have not known about. We can be judged of all. We can hear some truth. We can make some choices to get rid of some things and accept something new. And someone can fall down on their face. They can feel the subjection, the humility in their mind to a deeper depth of God. They can worship God and know that God is in you of a truth. That is God working through that person. They'll worship God. They'll know that truth came from God because there will be a witness there. 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together... Every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. So how is it? When you come together to preach and teach, to share God's words, you have a psalm, you have a doctrine, you have a tongue. Whatever you do, make sure it's done unto edifying. Make sure, there, if you're going to speak in tongues, make sure there's an interpreter. Make sure that understanding can be given so everyone can be spiritually built up or edified within their mind. 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. So if someone is going to speak in an unknown tongue or another language, let it be by two or three, so at the most two or three people doing it, and that by course, or one at a time, not two or three people doing it all at once, that would be confusion, and let one interpret. Make sure there's a gift of interpretation. So again, we see throughout this chapter a lot of seeds or instructions to govern speaking in tongues. 28, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So if there is no gift of interpretation, don't get up in a church service and speak in tongues, but you can pray in your own mind to God. If you really feel the need to speak in tongues, why not do it in your mind to God and let it be between you and God? Then you can personally be edified and the church service can go on. 29, let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. So this is what should be going on in a church service. Let the prophet speak. Let these people get up and speak God's words with inspiration, with understanding. Someone that has these gifts developed in their mind, maybe two or three people would take up a church service and let the others judge. Let the other people hear these words and let their discernment and judgment work. Does it witness? Is it truth? Is it anointed? Is it consistent? 30, if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. So again, more instructions to govern a church service. If someone is up on their feet preaching and teaching and God's spirit starts to lift, they shouldn't try to force the spirit or drag it out and preach for two hours. 
But if the inspiration lifts, they sit down because maybe someone else's mind has gotten inspired. Now they can get up and they can give a psalm, a doctrine, uh, some knowledge, some understanding. So another idea that we begin to see in this chapter is that there's not just one minister up in front preaching through an entire church service. We see it's a many-membered body of gifts like Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. One member cannot be the whole body. The many-membered body of Christ is a group of people all with a variety of gifts. So here we see from this chapter that there would be a variety of people getting up and speaking, not planning or canning a sermon, but being led by God's Spirit. Someone is up on their feet preaching and teaching. It may inspire a line of thought in someone else's mind. The first person sits down. Someone else gets up. They preach and teach. It inspires someone else's mind. God wants us all to get his words within our mind and to develop these gifts within us. 31. For ye may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. So when you prophesy, it should be one by one. This is more order on a church service not two or three people all trying to talk at the same time, all trying to compete at the microphone, and there's confusion, and there's interruptions, and it's, it's unkind, it's rude, but the order is one by one, get up and preach God's words with understanding so everyone can learn and everyone can be comforted. 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Paul says you can do it, you can do it one by one because the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Well, the spirit side within our mind, the inspiration, the anointing, the revelation, that's subject to us. In other words, we can keep it under control. If someone is on their feet preaching and it inspires lines of thought in our mind and we feel all this inspiration, we don't just fly out of our seat and start talking the same time someone else is. We can hang on to it. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. We can hang on to that inspiration. When they sit down, we can get up and we can let the gifts work in our mind. 33, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So if there is confusion going on in a church service, two or three people preaching at once, or all this speaking in tongues going on, that's confusion and God is not the author of that. God is the author of peace, and if we follow these instructions that God left for us, written through Paul, then we can have peace and order in the church service. Now, 34 and 35 may sound like Paul has totally changed topics, but Paul has not changed topics. He's still talking about the spirit of the prophets being subject to the prophets. He's still talking about order in the church service, but he just uses a different illustration to give the same point. And this is another topic that may have caused a lot of confusion, a lot of hurt, a lot of hatred, a lot of resentment in our mind, or if we're a man, maybe a, an exalted attitude because of not really understanding the scriptures. And a lot of times we focus on these next two scriptures, we don't read what follows or what comes before, and we don't read other scriptures that the same writer has recorded about the same topic. So Paul goes on to say, 34, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Well, if we take this in the natural or literally, we're going to have several problems, because first of all, it's never been God's order and never will be God's order to forbid women to speak in church. If we go back to the Old Testament, we see that Miriam was called a prophetess. She spoke God's words. We see in the New Testament, uh, in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter quoted from the book of Joel, and the prophecy was that in those days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. On my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy, men and women. We see that in the book of Acts, chapter 21, there was this man that had these four daughters that prophesied. There is Anna, a prophetess, mentioned in the book of Luke, chapter 2. There was women that helped Paul labor in the gospel. God is not a respecter of persons. When the scripture is saying that, God is telling the truth. So here, Paul is using a visible under the Old Testament. Under the Old Testament, because of the culture, this is the way things were for the most part. 
A man and a woman got married. They had large families. The woman stayed at home and took care of the children. The men traveled to Jerusalem three times a year for the feast. They heard the laws. They came home, and they taught them to the woman, the women. And that is a visible picture of God's blueprint and how God's blueprint works. It says in the book of Genesis that God made male and female in his image. Now, God is a spirit. He's not physical. So man and woman being in God's image is a picture of God's seed and substance. God's image is seed and substance or word and spirit. The male side pictures the seed side of God, and the female or the woman pictures the spirit side of God. We see another example of this in Ephesians chapter 5. The same writer talks about this relationship between husband and wife in Ephesians chapter 5. And again, if we don't read through the whole context of scriptures, we may think, boy, God made man superior and women is supposed to be so submissive and, and do whatever the man says and there's no equality. Well, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul does say that the husband is the head of the wife and that the women should be subject to their husbands. But he ends up, we need to look at that key phrase in verse 32 in chapter 5 of Ephesians where Paul says, this is a great mystery. Now, if Paul had been speaking in chapter 5 outrightly about man and wife, it would not be a great mystery. Pretty clear. He says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He was teaching the Ephesians the relationship between these words of Christ and between the church or the spirit in their mind that the words of Christ needed to govern the spirit to keep it clean. Just like he says in Ephesians 5, that he might sanctify and sanctify this church and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. It's going to take God's word governing our spirit to get it clean and to keep it clean. Now what has Paul been doing in this whole chapter? He's been giving him a lot of male side or a lot of seeds or a lot of instructions to govern their spirit side so that there isn't confusion in the church. When he says here, let your women keep silence in the church, it's really the same idea as he says in 1 Corinthians 14, 28, if there's no interpreter, keep silence in the church. In other words, don't let your spirit or your substance get out of control and be ungoverned by God's words and just start speaking in tongues in a church service when no one can understand what you're saying. That would be a shame for your woman to speak in the church. It would be a digression for the spirit side of your mind to get out of control and to get ungoverned and not to be guided by these seeds that I'm giving you. So again, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. This is another example of the female side of our mind, whether we're physically a man or a woman, being subject to the word or the seed side of God. We don't let our spirit get ungoverned or out of control. Another point to note is that the same writer wrote in 1 Corinthians 11 that women could prophesy as long as they had their heads covered. Now Paul wasn't saying in chapter 11 women can prophesy as long as their heads are covered and then here say women keep silence in the church. He didn't get confused. He didn't all of a sudden change his mind. But again, if we read through 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we soon see the symbolicness of this section of scriptures also. Women prophesying with their heads covered simply means let your spirit be governed by the male side or the seed side of God, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman. If we don't have God's words to govern our spirit, it will get perverted, it will get wild, it will be untamed. The same writer also says in Galatians 3, very important scripture, that if you're in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Was Paul confused? No, Paul was not confused. He knew exactly what he was talking about. We do get confused because we don't understand until we're taught what all these scriptures mean and how to put them together. When Paul said, just as when Christ came, Paul spent many chapters letting the Jews and Greeks know that it didn't matter what nationality they were. Whether they were a Jew or a Greek, they could both get this deeper depth of spirit. They could both get this new covenant. Same for the male and the female. Physically, it did not matter to God. There was not going to be any divisions or differences made between male and female. So again, the context here is let your spirit side be governed by the word side of God within your mind. So God didn't do away with the first covenant. It's true that the women stayed home and the men went to the feast and got the laws. But here, some spirit realm understanding is being given. Just like a lot of things that happened in the Old Testament were for pictures. They were shadows. They were types. 
God gave signs and visibles to the Jews. Here's another visible picture. Let's learn from it in the spirit realm, whether we're a man or a woman. Let's let God's word govern our spirit so that it stays pure, so that it stays clean. Now, another important scripture. Let's go on and read verse 36. Paul knew that when he mentioned this in 34 and 35 that people might want to take it literally and exalted spirits might want to hit the men. So he goes on to say in verse 36, What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only, men? So in case anyone wants to take this in the natural, Paul says, did the word of God just come from you men only? The answer is no. Did it just come to you only? Did I, Paul, only give the word of God to you men and only you men can preach it? The answer is no. Paul planted these words in men and women, and both men and women can prophesy. If we're making a division between men and women and how God can work through a man or a woman, then we're not in Christ yet. 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So if someone really thinks they're a prophet and they're, they're pretty spiritual, and then let him acknowledge, let him accept that these things that I'm writing to you are not just my ideas, but that these are the commandments of God. 38. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. So if someone wants to be ignorant that these are God's commandments, if they want to hang on to their own ideas and be exalted and, and have their own way about doing things, then Paul says that's your choice. If you want to be ignorant, then be ignorant. 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. So he makes it pretty plain. Paul's not saying it's wrong to speak in tongues. He's just saying in this chapter there's a time and a place for it. Speak in tongues all you want in the privacy of your own home. Just don't carry it on through a church service. It's not wrong to speak in tongues. Don't forbid it. It's a great thing. But covet to prophesy. Go after this prophesying, these voice gifts. As he says in the end of chapter 12, that to covet earnestly the best gifts, to go after these voice gifts. 40, let all things be done decently and in order. That's what the whole chapter's been about, is order and decency. And if we follow Paul's instructions, our church service will be done decently and in order.